by Ariana Staccato in the House of Irreconcilable Forces. And so it's actually great, and it was fantastic. Kate, thank you for talking about creativity and then showing the work is, because it very much is about being able to understand our surroundings through many different mediums. And while the students here are primarily focusing through material and architecture, it's also really important that they're understanding the siting of that architecture. And the studio is particularly focusing on the surroundings of Lubbock, Texas, so the landscape here of the Ana Estacado. And, and so being able to have the opportunity of the students presenting at a conference it, that deals with the natural world is an excellent chance. And, and so you'll hear a bit of, um, particularly from an exercise where we did an excursion out into the landscape about maybe a month and a half or so ago, where the prompt is for the students to identify features in the landscape that start to provide a, um, a visualization of an order or a structure. And we talk about that as being natural monuments or constructive monuments. So I'll, um, just to do, a, you'll be hearing from seven students and we'll have uh, Chris Brett, we'll begin to start with the, what he's terming liquid gold. And we'll have Jennifer Bean, who's be discussing Playa Lakes. Uh, Sergey Frizzell, who will be talking about the horizontal and vertical. And Caleb Lightfoot, with his green structures and the silo relationships. Uh, Robert Becerra, who will be talking about networkings and observations of landscape through networks. Mario Ramos is discussing uh, hidden forces, seeing that through wind. And Rebecca Reyes will be wrapping it up with a uh, discussion of dust. <laughs> so help me welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Let's make sure we got it's a control line. entitled Liquid Gold. Within the Yana, it is difficult to look inside what cannot be seen, a richness of resource demarcated only by the tall swinging pumps dressing to hold a vast property of a dehydrated corporate system. These nodes locate and begin to map an antique ocean below. Rick Bass, an experienced oil field tool pusher and geologist, writes, These lines of geological columns reveal the hidden ledges and beaches. In this, I believe he is referring to the geometry created and the entropy of the situation in the exploration of the oil fields. These pumps are simply tools of excavation to the monument, coring through a large aggregate sheets of sediment layers to find what was once so long ago. Their abundance inherently causes a grid of needles agitating the landscape. The clouds within the Yanu give hints to what it may look like below. Sized by pressure, sculpted by time, the oil fields below become to the mind's eye. Large pockets trapped within the sand and clay. Volumes of gold to the next corporate agenda, marketing childish energy to be exploited from the earth. The question comes to mind if we would harvest the clouds in the same fashion. Would long cores be reaching into their volumes? Similar structures positioned to find the best pockets of clouds to sustain a rotten scheme. Could this look similar to Rick's geological columns, but inverted? This monument is for resource, pumped fuel so that motor cars may run on the very land it came from. Skeleton homes, shriveled gas stations, abandoned restaurants, broken light poles, weathered stone walls give way to cookie cutter architecture, expanding with an endless ideology of temporary industrialization, leaving behind dry wells and moving to the next. This agenda abides to currency and is sustained by the monument it comes from. I decided to map the west portion of the Yanu and specifically the sparse abandoned 
gas stations that once served the monument. This is the Phillips gas station in Turkey, Texas, and the gas station in Florida, Texas. These stations are unique in the Llano Estacado in that they were once beacons of survival to continue travel by motor, by motor across the landscape. Their use relied on the consumption, but also the availability of crude oil and distributed from the Llano region in West Texas. This map depicts the process and the scale of the operation while linking distance of human labor to continue quantifying and transporting the liquid. The removal of this monument comes with a larger cost to the landscape, yet goes unseen in most of our lives. We claim its boundary is tethered to barbed wire, sectioned off like cut meat for consumption of the underground. These mappings expand the thought of what a misleading and ironic process consumes the land and the narrative that we are led to follow. This monument, 3,500 feet below, and yet we are to believe that it keeps the ball spinning. Rick Bass made this realization simple for myself. We try to map boundaries and string fence. We try to set up a border between life and death, between man and nature, between complicity versus incidents. But the truth is, there is no complicity. There is no innocence. There is only, and there is no death. There is only life. Rick Bass, The Sky and the Stars in the Wilderness. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jennifer Beam, and I will be discussing Playa Lakes and the Llano Estacado. The Llano Estacado is one that we have all become familiar with, one that is vast and usually seen as a barren, barren desert with little life and little to see. General Randolph Marcy, Marcy described the Llano in 1872 as a great North American desert, 400 miles from north to south, 250 miles from east to west, at 4,000 feet, elevation with not a tree, bush, or water. <laughs> what is seen by many as endless plains with nothing to see but horizon contains hidden beauty and importance. The Playa Lakes contrast this perception in a dramatic way. The Playa Lakes are an essential monument of the Llano Estacado. Playas create a mirror in the otherwise barren and dry landscape, particularly particularly during the golden hour. The sun is illuminated in the water, highlighting the landscape around, creating a monument. The sky above is reflected in the water, further enforcing this endless sky. The depression in the ground is filled with what is above it. We create a new atmosphere in the strange natural occurrence. The landscape around is inverted and can be manipulated by the slightest ripple and of duck wading through the water. The plateau by beyond is skewed by the wind blow moving the water, but the reflection of the vibrant sky remains. These magnificent events created with, within the Playa Lakes are temporary and ever-changing. The view and events change when the landscape around it is adapting and changing. The playas are also a monument because the playas and waterways are a critical resource for wildlife and for humans. The Llano Estacado is part of the central flyway of bird migration and home to many native animals. They vary in size, yet hold the key to wildlife. The Llano Estacado is also part of the Ogallala Aquifer, which, in which the playas play an essential role. Cadillac Desert describes it as the largest discrete aquifer in the world, and also the fastest disappearing aquifer. This also shows how playas are temporary. An example of this is a playa study done in the 70s, located in the Sal Collection. 
In Briscoe, Texas alone, in the wet period, there were 144 fires and dropped dramatically in the dry period to six aquifers. This is only one small area and demonstrates how the playas have a level of temporality to them and are affected by outside factors. As the playa lakes are an integral system within the Llano, the fluctuation of water levels has a massive effect uh, on migration, animals, aquifer levels, and irrigation. They are essentially depressions in the ground that collect and restore water to the ecosystem. In 1877, a traveler to the Llano Estacado recorded how fluctuations in weather transformed Pius. In late June, so tremendous an amount of water fell that it filled the depressions to overflowing. In early July, we could see outside water line by the buffalo chips and grass blades that made a drift line around the flood margins. But absorption and evaporation had caused the waters to recede until they were confined in the lower basins. One of these yet had a surface of about 10 acres when we found it. We can also see how the Yano itself can be, can be seen in the plan for the Ogallala Aquifer and how these natural water sources begin to contribute to the functionality and formation of the Yano Estacado itself. I have mapped the density of the Playa Lakes in the Yano as well as quantity. The plans are dotted with tens of thousands of natural water sources. These playas also redefine the boundaries as well as its definition. It is not a vast landscape without trees, bushes, or water. It becomes a landscape with multiple sources for light. We can also see the creation of atmospheres and expansion of the famous West Texas sky. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Sergey Frizzell, and I'll be presenting uh, my position on the horizontal aspect and the vertical aspect of the Llano Estacado. What gives the Llano Estacado its uniqueness and individuality? Vastness and an almost infinite horizontality are the two characteristics that visually define the plains of Texas and New Mexico. It is the strength of the landscape and its personality. It is the lateral freedom of vision that allows the naked eye to stretch its gazing limits without being hindered by obstructions and extrusions. It is awe-inspiring to witness the horizon instigate the struggle for visual dominance between the sky and the land. On one hand, you have the sky, a vast sea of blue that gently changes its shape and tone with respect to the gradual passing of the light, and on the other, land, the massive presence cloaked in the camouflage of juniper emerald, umber, and sangria colors in context of soft, sharp, and brittle textures. The horizon stitches the two together. This type of romanticism is synonymous with the position depicted by Rick Bass as he wrote regarding Texas landscape. Things, memories included, last longer in Texas deer hunting country. Exemplified here are the different types of man-made constructions that decimate the horizontality of the plane. These ambassadors of verticality are represented by grain silos, modern windmills, grain elevators, and oil pump jacks, the heights of which range from anywhere between 30 feet and 700 feet, roughly. They provide many amenities, such as grain and cotton storage and processing, harvesting of oil, and an efficient transformation of wind into electricity for the surrounding communities. That is their utilization. However, in this presentation, we're concerned with their presence, their visual effect on the landscape. Rick Bass also posed the question, is freedom a lateral component or a vertical one? When such colossal heights are juxtaposed upon an almost infinite horizontality, a decimation occurs, a decimation of the horizon line. That horizon line is what gives the Yano region its freedom, its visual and spatial freedom, the removal of which deprives the landscape of major characteristics that uphold its distinctiveness. The vertical is an intrusion almost parasitic in nature. From utilization point of view, these monuments bereave the plains of their resources. From spatial point of view, it is the introduction of these constructive volumes that 
contrasts the organic section of the topography of the surrounding landscape. It is the presence of the constructed that detracts visualization from the organic. The organic horizontal plane and the extruded volumes do not offer a reference of design to the surrounding Yana region. What used to be a clash of the naturals, this kind of land, has morphed into a struggle between the native horizontality and the constructed verticality. The continuing advance of man-made monuments of Texas and New Mexico is threatening the visual vastness of the Llano Estacado. The architecture is not the culprit behind these intrusions, but rather it is an opportunity to access a design-oriented scenario in which the horizontal and the vertical exist in harmony. The constructed should appropriate the natural topographies and edge conditions to create architectural scenarios that reminisce on the organic aspect of the landscape. The landscape and architecture should coexist in the atmosphere of visual unity, not unity that represents the efficient transfer of resources between the natural and the constructed, but a unity in presence of the vertical upon the horizontal once those resources are depleted and gone. The three biggest Spawn points for these vertical constructions are Midland, Lubbock, and Amarillo. And using this graphical overlaying technique of different line and texture elements, this mapping exercise abstractly illustrates the spread of these footprints from their source points. The vertical is not of the horizontal. The two extremes do not exist in elemental harmony, but rather pose a collocation of design essences. It is not an argument of necessity of the constructed to the inhabitants of the Yano, but the colossal statement that the verticality of these constructions make when intruded upon the vast and almost infinite horizontality of the Yana plane. When one looks at the horizontal vastness of the Yano, an experience of freedom is felt. It is a break from the dense urban urbanism of the large cities. The excerpt taken from Rick Bass as he wrote about it, his experience in uh, hunting in deer country provides a parallel example of self-sufficient system of elements. He wrote, in fact, you can get them just anytime you want. All you have to do is stop and look around and notice things. And you will realize that everything is just scheming right along. It is a closed system, still operating, oblivious to blunder, immune to disharmony. Therefore, the preservation of the horizontal aspect of Yano is essential for the Yano being true to its individualism for the years to come. Thank you. A question that emerges as we begin this process is thinking about what is the monument? Um, if we break the word down a little bit, we come to a Latin truth, which means that which is seen or visible. So imagine the uh, mausoleum of Augustus on the hills of Rome, trying to conjure a sense of that which lasts. This is, monu that this is a monument to an emperor. Um, but a question that emerges as we, were, as we began the process is, is the monument necessarily made of steel and concrete? Is it something which lasts, something which is seen? Or can the monument then be something that is intangible? A process of growth, for instance, something that is light and ephemeral. So pyramid and cylinder is a way of thinking about two architectural typologies that populate Lubbock and the Yana Estacado. These are the cotton sheds and the grain elevator. Trying to think about them in this way is interesting as we try to break them down into ancient architectural typology. But the question that comes up is, what is the purpose of these stru structures except to contain their containers? So is the monument the architecture or that which is contained? This is a quote from Gary Paul Napan, which reads, a seed is really something spiritual as much as it is something material. It contains a life spark that allows the regenerative process to happen. We need seeds because they are the physical manifestation of the concept that we call hope. So what Napin is suggesting is that the seed is something greater than its physical reality, that it's something ancient that comes to us generation by generation through a process of birth and death, and that it has a spiritual reality. 
This is content that acquires form. And what we're looking at today is the architectural reality, the constructed environment that allows this gathering to occur. These are some thoughts at the outset of this investigation. How is it gathered? The fragility of the grain against the wind, the vastness and the architecture, the pyramid and the cylinder. Gather the grain, monuments in an ocean of glass. So we're thinking today as the sea, as the grain is our protagonist, in the crisis of the plains and our drama, the wind emerges as the antagonist. We've got this problem here. We're basically on a flat shelf, the Llano Estacado. So how do farmers gather these small things that are meant to be planted to give new life? How do you gather that against the intensity of the wind? Uh, the Weather Channel uh, describes Lubbock as the third windiest city in America with 12.4 average mile per hour. So this is the kind of crisis that we're up against here. We have this thing, this delicate process of life and death. How is it gathered against this antagonist? Here's an image we're all familiar with, uh, with a haboom that moves across our city. Uh, I won't comment too much on this. Uh, Rebecca is going to talk about it in a little bit. Um, but we're all familiar with this reality and the sort of crisis that emerges of trying to gather these seeds. So uh, one of the things that we can begin to think about uh, is the, the grain elevator as an exterior, but also as an interior. Uh, this is an image taken as we were driving around the Llano Estacado. Uh, we were able to sort of look up into one of these and take an image. Um, and so one of the things that I want to posit is that when we begin to collage the idea of these things as an interior and an exterior, the architecture itself, div div uh, sorry, the architecture itself dissolves, leaving the contained. This is a mapping exercise exploring this idea by collaging the exterior and the interior of these structures. And then the question is asked, what if these things take on the scale of a map? For instance, the Llano Estacado in, uh, in plan is sort of overlaid within this container. And so one of the questions is, if in this tension between the interior and the exterior, what if we're all sort of existing within this structure? These are one of our types. These are the cylinders. These are the grain elevators. And at the same scale, we have the cotton sheds. These are our pyramids. And finally, the idea that perhaps the seed itself is the thing that is the monument, that which fills the container. These are some facts from the Lubbock Avalanche Journal. Lubbock is one of the largest uh, exporting uh, cities in the world for cotton. And so it goes all over the place, to China, to Peru. Uh, this is from 2013, and it says about 2.44 million bales of cotton were produced. Also, uh, other seeds are sorghum which were also sent to China and all over the world. As an aside, one thing to think about, this is an atlas of fields uh, from Lubbock and the surrounding region. Uh, these are images taken from Google Earth at various times and seasons. One of the things that's interesting to think about is that these are like large compasses inscribing new sacred geometries. So also there's a migration between scales. We have the architectural typology of the cylinder and the pyramid also as it compares to the large scale uh, circles of the center pit of irrigation fields. So the monument is this process of moving from the large scale to the container. And then finally, in Lubbock, the true monuments are not made of steel and concrete. <coughs> the protagonists of the Llano Estacado are seed and grain gathered against the wind. Content acquires form in the pyramid and cylinder. The formless and gathered and becomes the true architect. Robert Becerra. Um, <clears throat> my presentation is titled A Network in Space. Uh, the diversity of life in a place is not simply a random assortment of things. It is a, a fairly predictable set of organisms connected by certain ecological processes. Pollination services are among the most interactive processes 
involving, involving both flowering plants and animals. In this book, uh, the author talks about the importance of pollinators and the role in a <clears throat> and the role in a network of plant and reproduction. Like the network uh, or systems that happen in pollinating, so too there is a network that happens on the animal papaya. It starts with the Ogallala aquifer, a shallow water table aquifer surrounded by sand, silt, clay, and gravel located beneath the green plains. Excuse me. Ah, I don't know why I'm so nervous. <laughs> uh, Great Plains, United States. The aquifer is part of the High Plains aquifer system and re rests on the Ogallala Formation, which is the principal geological unit underlying 80% of the High Plains. <clears throat> the Ano Estacado lies at the southern end of the Western High Plains ecoregion of the Great Plains of North America. It is part of what was once called the Great American Desert. The Canadian River forms the Anu's northern boundary, separating it from the rest of the High Plains. To the east, the Caprock Escarpment lies between the Yano and the Red Permian Plains of Texas, while to the west, the Mescalero Escarpment demarcates the edges of the Pecos River Valley. The Yano has no natural southern boundary, instead blending into the Edwards Plateau near Big Springs, Texas. In the 1940s, Irrigators uh, adapted oil pumps to rise underground water to the surface. Combined with more powerful internal combustion and electric motors, these pumps could deliver water under pressure to the new pivot systems. All center pivot systems will set the overall speed of the system by governing the tower on the outside of a center, on a, of a center pivot circle. That's the tower that has to travel further and faster than the others towards the center. Because the pipe travels faster, the the, the farther it goes, more water has to be dist uh, distributed at the ends of a pivot system than in the middle. The pivot systems are connected from one to the next. They are connected by the pipes that provide the water that comes from rivers, lakes, and aquifers. <clears throat> this map shows the rivers, lakes, and the aquifer from which the Llano Estacado drinks. As you can see, the entire Llano sits atop the Agalala. The Ano Estacado, a vast landscape of flowing grasses and cotton, cattle graze 37,000 uh, square miles. A network, a network lives here, a network that feeds the lands, that feeds the grasses, that feed the cattle, that feed the people. The network begins with the pumps that bring the water from the Ogallala. The Ogallala, 174,000 square miles of underground water. The network pumps the water and feeds the land. The network connects from pivot to pivot to pivot. Grasses grow, they sway in the wind, dry waves. The herds come through like the bison before them. The grasses provide the nutrients from the earth into their bodies. Their bodies go strong, our bodies go strong. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Mario Ramos, and I will be speaking to you about hidden forces in the Llano Estacado. In the letter from Texas, Townsend Miller spoke of this landscape as the Great Plains now, the bare land, the open ranges, the wind's world, sun's empire, plains of the sun, Llano Estacado, and here, I think, is the heart of it. William Tideman referred to the Llano Estacado as an ocean of wind. Both author authors describe their perception of the Llano Estacado, where the hidden forces are a key component to this landscape. The Llano Estacado may be vast, but it is not empty. It is full of wind. <clears throat> At a height of about 230 feet, and varying in several, varying in several sizes. Above the expansive horizon of the Llano Estacado, white technological stakes 
harvest and reveal a hidden force within the seemingly flat landscape. Wind turbines, also known in West Texas as wind turbines, the tallest kinetic monuments to challenge the flat landscape, capture the invisible winds and convert it into energy to power our devices. Average wind speed on the Llano de Cicado is about 12 miles per hour, making it the perfect landscape for harvesting the invisible winds and creating a tangible relationship to them. These monuments to the wind reify a relationship between the sky, the land, and us. They project into the sky, plant their feet in the land, and anchor themselves even deeper to remain erect. Their stems are thin lines in the horizon, almost invisible as the winds they harvest. Their beauty is the 50-foot long fins that spin in the horizon. Each wind turbine spins at its own pace, sometimes over overlapping each other and blotting out the sky. They provide clean, renewable energy without polluting our environment. They only need a small plot of land and access roads for occasional maintenance. Wind farms minimally transform the land they stand on, creating narrow access roads that branch off for each monument. They are spaced three diameters width apart, or 300 feet linearly. Cattle are able to graze nearby, or farmers can plant their crops. Through the monuments, we are able to see the wind speed and direction. The presence of wind farms allows us to visualize wind movement in the horizon. Our sight becomes attuned to see the invisible winds through rhythms of gentle spins in our travels into the Llano Estacado. The winds in the monuments greet us. It is called a West Texas welcome. They can be seen day or night creating rhythms in the sky. The relationship to the Llano Estacado is pre-existing. The wind turbines enhance our perception in a vertical direction and in time. But the ancestors of these monuments helped settle and traverse the Llano Estacado. The windmills are the original monuments to spark a relationship to the sky, land, and water. They were used to pump unseen water from beneath the surface of the Llano Estacado. They were spaced at intervals of 15 miles apart to refuel steam engines traveling across the Llano Estacado. They helped ranchers provide water for their cattle. A relationship to the invisible winds was established through kinetic wind harvesting monuments that evolved over time. Welcome to Wind's World. We are able to see the invisible winds through the monuments that evolved from the windmills that make the Llano Estacado a place for human habitation. The Llano Estacado is not empty. It is filled with the ocean of wind that fills our lives through energy. If we leave and come back, we can be sure we'll experience that West Texas welcome through the hidden forces in the Llano Estacado. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Rebecca Ilya Reyes. In The Wasteland, T.S. Eliot writes, I will show you fear in a handful of dust, but hopefully today I will show you a glimpse of monumentality instead. While traveling throughout the Llano Estacado, one cannot help but notice a plethora of monuments that dot the landscape. From cathedral-like grain elevators and cotton seed sheds to pump jacks that bow over and over to the landscape, one is left in awe of a landscape that is seemingly filled with motion. In Landscapes, J.B. Jackson writes, but there is always a slight movement, tourists on their way to some spectacular destination, trucks headed across the continent, a horseman or a Navajo wagon raising a minute cloud of dust somewhere miles away, and simply by being in motion yourself, you felt that you belonged. The land of the Llano Sacado is always moving. It moves when you move. The land is in the air. 
It weaves itself into every place, settling before moving on and being moving on and being replaced by itself. The land stretches out, encircling you within a broken horizon. Here, the land is isolating, omnipresent, gargantuan, microscopic, and ephemeral. Dust is often thought of as a collective, when in reality it is particular. Monuments are also thought of as singular and vertical. Dust, however, derives an aspect of its monumentality from its horizontality, a flatness which gives birth to other monuments. Although always present in the air, the vertical monumentality of dust is most recognizable in the form of dust storms, or haboobs as we call them here, an event that dwarfs all other monuments. Typically, static presence over time confers monumentality. Dust is ever-present, but not static. It is always reasserting itself despite attempts to contain or change it. Dust is the remnants of other monuments. Here, the landscape is always changing, just as you cannot hold the same handful of dust. Dust slips away like time and place. Dust usually comes with foreboding connotations, such as plight and hardship. The Greek goddess Apollos was considered to be the personification of eternal night. Appearance-wise, she was described as pale, emaciated, and weeping, and having mounds of dust resting upon her shoulders. Leona Cicado, unfortunately, is often thought of as an Atlas, lonely, barren, and with broad dust-covered shoulders. But Gray Lopez gives us another, look, another perspective. In Desert Notes, Gray Lopez writes, I know what they tell you about the desert, but you mustn't believe them. This is no deathbed. Dig down, the earth is moist. Boulders have turned to dust here. The dust holds like graphite. You can hear a man breathe at a distance of 20 yards. You can see out there to the edge where the desert stops and the mountains begin. You think it is perhaps 10 miles. It is more than 100. Just before the sun sets, all the colors will change. Green will turn to blue, red to gold. Now, most monuments we do not sweep up. Most monuments we do not trek back into the house. Pervasive and ever-present, dust offers us a subtle intimacy, an intimacy with a place that is constantly changing, but one that is woven deep into the landscape's fabric. With the vast yana cicada stretched out before us, one does not have to look far to see the elusive beauty left in the dust. Thank you. So that concludes some presentations, but I'm going to ask the question to be Yes. If there are questions or subjects that they presented, I'm curious to hear more about. I'm curious where you got the map of wind circulation through the yellow. The map of the wind? Yeah. Since wind is always changing, it's temporarily. I chose this one specific day to evacuate after a storm and uh, through the weather, weather maps. Uh -huh. Online, okay. I was able to just draw over it. I forget what data. <laughs> it's all right. I just had not seen that representation, or had seen it rep represented in that manner before, so that was interesting. Christopher? There was, in the middle of your presentation, what looked for all the world to be a poem. Is that your poem? Um, I suppose. I, I didn't put anybody else's poem. It was more like just kind of my roots. Well, you count that as a poem. <laughs> <laughs> it may have been what I thought. It's the abandoned gas stations, the stone, whether it's stone walls. Yeah, may, maybe it was, Caleb. I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 Don't count it. Caleb, yeah. In the very middle, when you were, when you had those lines and the sun was going down, that was a poem. It intended to be a poem. Uh, I'm hesitant to use that word. It was just, yeah, some initial thoughts that started the investigation. Okay. Don't count it, Christopher. You count it as a poem. Nice. Well, I, I mean, I'd like to, I think many of you can count what you've written in poems. I, it was beautiful, um, a lot of your presentations. And then um, the maps were, were really beautiful that a lot of people have. I actually wondered if you might make those. I mean, you could even make posters out of those. I'm, I'm moving away from love because I'm getting all nostalgic, frantically nostalgic, <laughs> but I'm like, some of those images, um, I just think are, are incredible and they capture the landscape in a different sort of way, so I wonder if you might consider making them available or making posters and selling them or something like that. There are already posters. There are? They're on our walls in the studio. And okay. I think if, 
you'd like to see them, we also have them posted on our wiki website, which okay. we can give you. Okay. I really loved your graphic design too. It was just a, a treat to, to, uh, to uh, see this. And you guys had a lot of uh, um, uh, images showing motion. Um, I guess they were in films taken while driving. And because of architecture, um, either channel or, or, or uh, um, it's certainly directed toward efficiencies, we can slow people down. We seem so controlled by, um, by our automobile society and the speeds. Um, I, I just wanted to know what your comments were. Why, why so often do you use uh, uh, um, these uh, videos of motion? How that fits into our scene? what you thought about that in terms of design, um, what responsibility you can bear to the, the speed of our roads or slowing down and making us a more sane society. Well, you bring up a really good point just because we, we all kind of noticed when we were traveling the Yano that there's these great distances by foot, distances that seem almost impossible almost to survive, but then even in the car, there's a different proportion of that distance, even though it's the same distance. But there were these proportional relationships, you know, that sort of captured it all at once. And a simple picture couldn't capture the, what kind of Zerge was explaining, this large horizon, uh, which while we were studying the light too, it happened to be kind of about uh, the change in the light position during the day as well. So we had multiple videos where it was, there, you know, there were a couple hours long shortened down. Uh, but it was for that reason. Rebecca, why did you choose the dust to focus on? And how does that relate to, you know, design or, or construction or things of that nature? How I chose dust was probably because it kept getting my eyes when I was looking at other monuments. <laughs> um, no, uh, I think it was, while we were out on this excursion, we had to find monuments in Alaska that resonate with us. And one monument that seemed to always be there was the dust. Um, it was present pretty much everywhere we looked for some pieces had more from jacks than green toes. And typically when I think about this area of land, I typically think of the color, the dust. Um, my mom jokingly calls this place the land of Cynthia. Hmm. Um, which you can see quite lovely actually. Um, but I think architecture is not necessarily about built uh, environments, so just Kayla mentioned it's more about what was contained. And in my position it would probably be the opposite, like what you're trying to do about it. Uh, in this case, but um, yeah, I think it was one of the more interesting aspects of this layer. Could you, um, this is for any one of you or all of you, but I'm curious about how your relationship with the Yano has changed potentially over the course of the work you've done here. That, you know, did you start out with a close relationship and then find yourself in one or the opposite. Um, I think this is a place that a lot of people arrive from other places and look at the landscape and think it's a nowhere place. But watching and listening to you, it seems a place of great beauty and interest. Right? Even the dust is fascinating um, through, through your lenses. Yeah, so maybe, I, go ahead. I, was, I think there's something that also uh, Kept referring to our trip we took around the Amos to kind of as a pilgrimage, <laughs> and I, I, it's maybe a little bit silly, but um, there was something real about that for me at least to actually uh, dedicate a weekend to just driving and camping without like a destination. It's not like we were going to go to Amarillo and then come back. It was it was you know a loop that we took around, and so uh, it was kind of purifying in a way to to set out on that journey with with the focus of looking for monuments because. It almost, for me at least, it almost acquired a sort of sacred connotation. You know, like what are the, what are the, what is the beauty here? What are the, the sacred geometries and architectures of this place? You know, and so I, I don't know. I, I, I would imagine a lot of this probably. I mean, my experience was freshman year, about six years ago. Um, I came to Lubbock for the first time for my orientation. I saw nothing. Like, I just saw flat. Mm -hmm. I, I guess I was almost blind to it. But uh, on our excursion or our pilgrimage, we call it. Uh, the more we like immersed ourselves into the landscape, the more detail we saw. So I mean, we would stand out there one sunset for like I don't know, was it three, four hours in one spot, just looking. 
like and recording, taking pictures, and uh, taking field notes and stuff. And the more, I guess, the more time we spent on the landscape, the more detail we saw, and uh, uh, the more we were able to witness and observe. Um, I think this area might still fall under the, the huge realm of the prairie style. And that's mostly horizontal, except I think in Oklahoma there's one right skyscraper on the Price Tower. And you were, you were I think, certainly you were talking about verticality and horizontality. And I think that's democratic architecture because it's horizontal um, rather than higher, higher up and pull on the vertical. So do you guys, are you, do you feel any influence of sway of that historic style, style of the prairie style over your, um, your identity as architects? Are you prairie style of architects? That's all I'm saying. Can you explain what you mean by prairie style? That's the, the Frank Lloyd Wright uh, style. Oh, okay. Um, I missed the first couple of uh, presentations, but did anybody talk about the the young, the the aspect of the Yano Estacado itself? I mean, did y'all in your your travels did you go down off of the Cap Rock and actually look at the uh, the escarpment? You know, which is what uh, brought the name to the Yano Estacado. Yes, we did. Okay. We, we went to Buffalo State. Buffalo Canyon State Park. Yeah. We camped up, just, I think, a little bit on the escarpment. And I also traveled to Dallas, which meant I had to view it again. But one thing that seemed very particular and which would drew me to find these relationships between the wind turbines and the winds was the fact that I could see in the escarpment there was this distinct, almost hidden change in the atmospheric pressure. And uh, there was something that we only saw by chance. There was a plane that was flying by, and it left a little stream cloud. And for some reason, there was one point that the very end tip of it was pulled away and kind of made like a ribbon in the sky. And that was, um, that was actually kind of one moment that I saw that the edge of the Yano Cicado actually reaches up into the sky as well, into the atmosphere. How many of you are from this area? Just one? Okay, so uh, as Professor Caswell uh, mentioned a minute ago, uh, how has this environment impacted you as architects? Do, do you think that you will carry anything away from this uh, pilgrimage that you went on and that, that may influence your architecture? particularly from an environmental point of view? Um, I would say that's probably the strongest point of view that has affected me. And I think architecture is sort of like a vessel for time. And I think time here also looks extremely different from some, say, somewhere else or a big city. I'm from San Antonio. Um, but I consider myself being more West Texas than Southern Texas now. Um, I love this area. And I would agree that environmentally, I'm much more aware about site and place, as well as light, as well as what we're saying in I think I, mean, I grew up in Midland, and so kind of West Texas. And, yeah. Um, I remember for most of my growing up, I, I wanted to live around trees or mountains or, you know, like I, I associate this landscape as desolate and boring. It is desolate, but it's beautiful because of that. So um, I think riffing off what the question you were asking earlier, um, I think there is something about, and this is what the studio has been really interesting uh, in sort of prepping our brains is how do you reconcile uh, the vastness with the localization of an architecture. So there is something about horizontality, but you can't occupy the Yano Estacado. You know what I mean? Like it's it's so it's so vast. So that it becomes a very different kind of constructed reality trying to reconcile or not reconcile the vastness with the architecture. 
and just allow them to exist and co-inhabit one another. So I think there is something about uh, the sort of uh, the extension of this place that is part of what is doing. Well, I personally found y'all's um, presentations quite uh, engaging, interesting, and uh, illuminating. That's it now.